Welcome to the Power of Your Voice podcast with your host, Johnny Gorky. You have the power to overcome challenges and fears. Let my voice and the voice of many others show you how to transform these challenges into opportunities. To learn more about future podcasts and read episode show notes, check out my website at www.thepowerofyourvoice.com. This is episode 15, and today's guest is Becca Tripp. Becca may have bipolar, but that does not stop this incredible badass artist from stepping into her leadership. She has shifted herself in such an incredible way and transformed mental illness into a gift. Becca was born in England and was mentored under award-winning Russian painter Tamara Gadez. While working as a software developer and designer, Becca became an active member of Reno's underground art scene, helping to ignite the city's revival as a culture hub. She now draws inspiration from yoga, dance, motherhood, and her personal experience with mental illness, which influenced both her subject matter and her process. Welcome to the Power of the Voice podcast. So today I get to interview the amazing Becca. So Becca, how did you overcome your mental illness and shift into being your amazing gift that you have right now? (laughs) Well, You know, I don't know if you can ever truly overcome a mental illness in that, you know, it's always going to be a part of my life and a part of who I am. What I have overcome is it ruling my life and uh, debilitating my life. And so what I've learned to do is basically just realize that I am more powerful than any illness. I am more powerful than what my illness will ever make me do or or and that I get to be 100% responsible in that as well and I get to be 100% responsible in taking care of myself and making sure that I'm playing the best game I can play and not allowing any kind of mental illness or chronic illness because mental illness is really just another kind of chronic illness that happens in the brain not allowing it to rule my life and not allowing it to stop me from being exactly the kind of person that I want to be Exactly. So what exactly contributed to you mental health in us? So when I was in high school and college, I started experiencing uh, symptoms of bipolar where I would have manic episodes and then I would have depressive episodes. And when I was manic, I would spend a bunch of money on crazy things. I would go out and be, you know, very flirtatious and Um, and I was often very destructive. And then when I was depressed, I would be completely withdrawn. I would stop going to my classes at school and I would just kind of sit around in libraries and dorm rooms, not really knowing what to do with myself. I was just like, I was completely broken and I was having panic attacks multiple times a day because for me, uh, depression tends to manifest as anxiety which it does for a lot of people. And, um, and at that time I was so sure that I could take care of myself and that I didn't need any help and that I didn't need any support and that, you know, I didn't need to admit that there was something going on with me and I didn't need to ask for help. And that was very destructive in my life for a long time. But I was also a very resourceful person, so I was able to be very high-functioning and still, uh, from outward appearance, look like I had everything together, when in fact, I really didn't. And it wasn't actually until I had my son two years ago. He just turned two in January. And an interesting thing about bipolar is it's very sensitive to hormones, so when you have postpartum hormones, everything goes crazy in your body and your hormones go crazy out of whack. And um, so people that are bipolar tend to experience postpartum depression and in, in many cases also experience postpartum psychosis. And that's what happened to me. And I remember the experience of it was unlike anything I've ever experienced in my life. Like I really felt like I was losing my mind. I remember I was hearing voices. I wasn't sleeping. 
um, I wasn't hearing voices. I was actually hearing my baby crying when he was sleeping or when he wasn't with me, which if you've ever heard a newborn crying, like it's an extremely stressful sound. Yes. So to be hearing that like all the time is it would make anybody feel like they're crazy. And, um, I was having like horrible nightmares and horrible visions all the time. And I was still trying to keep it together. And I finally hit this point when it's like, I, w I remember standing in the bathroom and looking at the walls and they were moving. And at that point I was like, something is seriously, seriously wrong with me. And I can't keep pretending that everything's okay. I need to start talking about it. And so for the first time in my life, I went to my husband and I said, I'm not okay. And of course he knew that I wasn't okay, but he didn't know how to talk about it. Uh, so he needed me to say something first. And I went to him and I said, I'm not okay. And I think I really need some help and I need to make an appointment to see a nurse. And, um, and I also called my mom and I said the same thing to her. I said, I just want to let you know that I'm really not okay. And then I'm going to see the doctor and figure out what's going on with me because I'm really not okay. And, um, and I found myself a little checklist of postpartum depression symptoms. And I went through and I was checking all the boxes that applied to me. And it was almost all of the boxes. And I was like, oh my God, what is going on with me? And I took that with me to go see the doctor. And she was so kind and she told me, you know, like, you're not even the first person this month that I'm going to say this to. You're going to be okay. You're going to get through this. But right now you need support. And I'm so glad that you came to me and you told me and you were honest about what's going on with you. And in that moment, I was still not in my right mind. So I was terrified. I was so terrified of what was going to happen to me, what was going to happen to my baby, what was going to happen to my family. I was afraid they were going to take him away from me. You know, all sorts of crazy thoughts were running through my mind. But at the same time, I remember feeling a sense of safety. I remember feeling a sense of the world is going to support me. There are people who are going to support me and I don't have to do this alone anymore. And that was an amazing feeling to have even despite everything that was going on in my brain that was making me think and feel all kinds of crazy things to have this solid sense of support and being held and being cradled um, was an extremely life-changing experience for me well to just to back up a little bit like for uh -huh. some people who might be listening to this like what is bipolar you know <laughs> How does it affect you? How, how does that look like? You know, for some people, maybe they have a family member who's bipolar and they're like, yeah, you know, they act like this, but I don't really understand what exactly is it and, and how does it feel? Like, can you kind of ex give us a good example of like, how is your everyday kind of experience? So bipolar is a mood disorder and it's based in the chemistry of the brain. And I don't know all of the science exactly of how and why it works, but basically what happens is you're on a kind of um, roller coaster from high mood into low mood. And it affects three things. It affects your mood, which is uh, whether you're sort of happy or sad or um, grumpy or excited or um, just in a positive place or in a negative place, I guess is the easiest way to explain it. It also affects your energy levels. So when you're high and you're at the top of the spectrum, your energy levels are like extreme. So you have so much energy, you're sleeping like an hour or two a night and you're just go, go, go. Like you're super caffeinated all the time, but it just is natural. And uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, when you're depressed, you have super low energy. So even just doing simple things like taking a shower or getting out of bed in the morning or walking down the road to get the mail um, can be extremely overwhelming because you just don't have the energy to get yourself going. And then there's also the third thing that it affects is your... Um, 
your thought patterns. So your thought patterns shift from being very, very positive and having ideas of grandiosity when you're manic, you're um, more skewed to the positive than normal. So if you think there's like a baseline that most people are at, then when you're above that, you're manic, then you're in a place of being like super grandiose, thinking that maybe you're like royalty or that you're a superhero or that you're like a prophet of God. Some people experience um, things like, like um, feeling like they're like a religious icon or something like that. So having like an extreme sense of self and then on the opposite end of the spectrum in depression, it can be an extremely negative view of the self. So feeling complete worthlessness, feeling complete um, like a failure as a human being or like you're a dirty, broken person, things like that. Um, so when you put all of those three things together, it creates a really um, difficult disorder to manage because you're looking at people that are experiencing the highest highs of like the human condition and the lowest lows. And then they're bouncing back and forth between them. So you can imagine how sort of difficult it is to be on this constant roller coaster and not be able to control it. Uh, the good thing is about bipolar in particular is that it's very, very treatable. There's a lot of medications out there and, and it's different for everybody. What works for one person will not work for another person. So it's something that, uh, you know, you really want to spend time working with your doctor on. And it's also, you know, can be very well managed through lifestyle changes as well. Like for me, I have a multifaceted treatment plan, which includes medication. I take one medication at a fairly low dose, so I'm not super medicated. And, uh, you know, I also eat a healthy diet and I get exercise and um, I do a lot of mindset exercises, uh, gratitude practice, things that keep me from spiraling into a place of depression and also keeping me from spiraling up into a place of mania. So keeping me kind of just level and even keel and balancing things out. So I still experience a little bit of a roller coaster, but it's not as extreme and debilitating of a roller coaster. It's more just like a fun ride through life. Now for some people with bipolar, do some of them stay more at the like the high life is just great the the good stuff I should say do they some people stay more at the the higher end where you're happy you got all this energy and all that kind of stuff you kind of feel like a god or or whatnot some superstar and then do some people stay more on the lower where they're 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 usually depressed and they don't feel good and that kind of thing so there's a, a couple different types of bipolar and in many ways it is a spectrum disorder so you can exist anywhere on a spectrum from being what's called bipolar two, where you tend to stay on the bottom end of things. You tend to have long periods of depression, and then you might go up into what's called hypomania, which is a less extreme form of mania, where you generally feel really good and you have more energy, and you're, you're kind of like above the baseline, but not too far above the baseline. Uh, but the periods of depression can be very debilitating. And then what I have is called bipolar one, where I, I'll experience periods of depression. And then I'll also um, have the potential to experience episodes of true mania. And the problem with mania is that it's actually a very dangerous place to be. It's not all fun and games by any means. Um, it can be very uh can be very dangerous because you can do things that are completely irrational uh, without realizing. You can spend a lot of money. You can, um, some people tend to be very sexually promiscuous when they're in a state of mania. Uh, some people might um, do things that are very dangerous, like climbing up buildings or driving really fast cars or um, putting themselves and other people in danger. A lot of uh, people will get ar arrested when they're in a state of mania. A lot of people will uh, end up hospitalized. Uh, 
because it's just very unstable. So it's an important thing to consider if you do know someone that's bipolar is if they have the potential to go into that state of mania, then they may do things that seem completely inexplicable to you. And it's just because their brain is not in a stable place. Yeah, Becca, thank you so very much for sharing that. Because that's the thing. It's like, you know, for a lot of people that might be listening, they, you know, you're just talking about different situations where people could be in. And you might have somebody in your life where they do a lot of that stuff. It's like, why are they doing it? So do you think, you know, maybe three, four or five of those different things that they might be doing that there might be a possible chance that they might be slightly bipolar or something? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of people that go undiagnosed for a long time. And, um, you know, I think it's important for everybody to understand some of the symptoms, uh, not just of bipolar, but of various mental illnesses and understand that it's not something that people are doing on purpose. It's the way that their brain chemistry works. It is a disorder of the brain and it is an illness and it's not something that makes them more or less of a person. It just is like any illness that a person can have. It's like having a broken leg or having a chronic pain condition. It's just something that affects the brain. And unfortunately, because it affects the brain, it also affects behavior. So sometimes when somebody's behaving very irrationally and erratically it might be because they have something serious going on in their brain chemistry wow that's that that's great great to know so you know when were you diagnosed and you know how did you come into terms for that because you know there might be somebody listening right now like you know i don't know maybe i'm bipolar but maybe they're, they're scared you know or maybe, you know, they have somebody in their family, you know, maybe boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, brother, sister, maybe a grandparent, you know, whoever that might be. And they're like, you know, they're thinking, wow, maybe they, they're going through bipolar. You know, what, what, what's some, some good things that, you know, you might suggest that, you know, they're able to do to help that person? Well, first I would suggest like educating yourself on what exactly this illness is and what it looks like and how it manifests. And the second thing I would recommend is finding a support team and um, putting together a group of people in your life, whether it's family and friends and a doctor and um, maybe a support group of people that really understand what you're going through and that can uh, that you can speak to honestly about what you're experiencing. And the third thing I would say is, you know, give yourself some time to come to terms with it because it can be a really difficult thing and it's easy to go down a path of like, um, I'm broken or I'm not a fully functional human being or, I'm somehow less than because of this. And that's not true at all. And it's also, it can feel very sort of, um, I don't know, like, like my life is over. How am I supposed to ever live a normal life again now that I know that I have this disorder? And it doesn't have to look like that. It gets to be something that you handle in your life and that you take care of yourself and do whatever you need to do to make sure that you are in a good, positive place. And also be very gentle with yourself to know that not every day is gonna be easy and that's okay. And also that you have the capability to be anything you wanna be and that you don't have to limit yourself and you don't have to, um, you don't have to, you know, your life isn't over. You get to be so much more than your mental illness. You get to have a mental illness and be everything else that you are. It doesn't define you. It's not who you are as a person. And when you feel depressed, that's not who you are as a person. It's just you on a bad day and that's okay. Exactly. That is so extremely powerful. So, 
you are a badass artist. Oh my gosh, you are such an incredible artist. Now, how has art been your form of your voice? Because, you know, you paint and oh my gosh, beautiful, beautiful art. So for me, painting has always been a way for me to express myself in a way that I don't know how to speak in words, you know? Um, I love to write, I love to speak, but there's certain things that I just don't know how to say with words, like words are just not enough. And what I realized is that there's things that I can say in pictures and um, it's just another language. It's just another way to express something. And for me, it's a very emotional thing. So I can express uh, human emotion on a very deep level rather than just sort of saying trying to put words to feelings like oh sadness or happiness or um you know excited or vulnerable or um you know any myriad of words it's it's a picture that can encompass so much more and i feel like it's something that people can really connect with and say yes i know what that feels like because we've all been there and we've all experienced all of these different emotions and moments and uh, resilience in particular is one thing i like to speak to a lot because it's something that we can all connect with of, of what it feels like to be in a low place but to know in your heart that you're going to get through it because you're stronger than your circumstances and that's something that I like to remind people of because I think it's easy to forget. I think it's easy to feel overwhelmed by your circumstances in life. And the reality is, is that we're bigger than that. We get to overcome. We get to overcome anything. Wow. So like as an artist, like when you are out there and you're painting, like how do you feel? Like where, where, where do you get your inspiration and all that kind of stuff? Because, you know, when you look at your work, like, you know, you paint these beautiful pictures of women and you know they're, they're very artistic nudes but they're like when you look at the, the picture of the women's faces they just seem so confident so comfortable in, them, in themselves it's just extremely beautiful and where 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 do these images come from you where where do they come they just randomly come in your mind like where 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 do you get these ideas oh my gosh yeah i mean it's almost like they come from I, they come from my mind. Obviously, they come from my mind, but they come from a deeper place in my mind that's not like your surface level thoughts that happen in the front of your brain. It's like they come from somewhere further back, like in my subconscious. And it's much more of a feeling. It's much more of an emotion. It's much more of, a, of an experience that I feel throughout my whole body. And I'll be like standing there and moving my body in different places and kind of figuring out and like feeling it out what feels right what's what I'm trying to say and what does it look like and then it's just a matter of translating those feelings into a picture that can stay on the canvas and speak what I want it to speak so it's a very like it's a very intuitive process and when I'm doing the painting itself I tend to lose track of time I get very like into it and I almost go into a flow state of um, just being like completely in the process and I'm not really thinking at all I'm not thinking about oh I need to put a little bit of red right there or a little blue blue right there it just kind of just comes very naturally which I think is is a really fun and exciting way to paint so it's just it was thinking about this so like with bipolar and being an artist like when you're painting well like where are you are you in like the high state you know that that, that kind of thing um honestly i would say neither i would say i'm grounded and very centered um and i think that's possibly one of the reasons that i like to paint so much is because it is a place i can come to where i feel very centered and very balanced and um, not like I'm flying off the handle and not like I'm sinking into a deep hole, but just like very um, connected with my authentic self. 
That's absolutely beautiful. So yes, for someone who's going through bipolar, if they don't have like some kind of passion, you know, it's probably a really good idea to find something that you absolutely love that you can really throw yourself in because being an artist, you know, it has to be extremely therapeutic for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I would say find something that makes you feel centered. It makes you feel grounded and it doesn't matter what it is. And it, it doesn't matter if you're good at it or not, you know, it just find something that makes you feel good and not like, not like you're going crazy, not like you're super excited and like you're a party animal, but just something that makes you, that lights you up. You know, I always like to talk about things lighting you up. Like what feeds your soul? what makes you feel full and whole and like full of light and love? What makes you just feel super grateful to be alive? And if you can connect with those things, those activities and just do them as often as you can, like that's the most therapeutic thing you can do for yourself. That's very powerful. Now for some people like, Oh, there's all these things I want to do, but I don't have the time what's something that you might recommend to that person, you know, because it's so important to do something you absolutely love. Well, I would say two things. I would say first, it doesn't have to be a lot. It doesn't have to look a certain way. It can be a little bit here and there. Um, it can be something small. It can be something easy. It's, you know, sometimes if something feels too big and too overwhelming, just break it down into little pieces, break it down into like a mini habit that you can do for five minutes every day. And the other thing I would say is that you always have time, you know, and you get to decide what's a priority. No one else decides that for you. I know we all have jobs and we all have obligations and commitments, but you get to decide what's important. You get to decide what takes a priority. And I think one thing that's important, especially if you're battling a mental illness or whatever you're battling in your life, you know, you get to make yourself a priority and you get to make taking care of yourself and doing what lights you up a priority in your life because that's only going to make you stronger. It's only going to make you happier and that's going to do more for the people in your life as well. So it's really like the most generous thing you can do is to make sure that you are well taken care of first because you cannot pour from an empty cup. That's so extremely true. Now, one, one thing I was noticing when I was looking on your website, so, you know, with your art, it's absolutely so beautiful and everyone's so happy and so confident and all that. But one thing I was not expect is expecting to see is, so you have these paintings of mental health pictures. You know, as I said, I wasn't expecting that. And it's very fascinating how you paint many different mental health disorders, like some, you know, I noticed you had somebody using needles, you had a cutter, you had someone with eating disorder, and then it looked like you had a guy who had some severe anger issues. Where did these stories come from as well? And it was really cool how, you know, you had all these different details. It was entire story in one painting, which I thought was absolutely incredible. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, that was a project I did when I was actually in college. Uh, my final year of college, and um, and it was a whole series about mental illness. And what's interesting is I hadn't even, I probably knew on some level, but I hadn't admitted to myself, and I certainly hadn't been diagnosed at that point, uh, that I had my own mental illness. But it was something I was, I was very fascinated in, uh, probably for a reason. Uh, but I was very fascinated by it, and I have a lot of empathy for people that we're struggling with different illnesses and I wanted to create a series of paintings that would um, essentially create that experience for the viewer so for people looking at these paintings they would get a little taste of what the experience of having these mental illnesses is like and um, and they're not easy pictures to look at which I love because they're not easy illnesses to live with. And uh, so my goal was to create, um, create an experience 
of diving into these mental illnesses as a way to break down some of the stigmas around it and as a way to open up the conversation and start talking about this is what people are going through every day and wouldn't it be good if we could really understand in a way that maybe we're not always equipped to understand and maybe these pictures can illuminate and shed a little light on that and uh, the response that I had to those paintings I I put them in the show and the response I had was absolutely phenomenal like almost every person was like wow I know some person or that's me even or you know this was my brother and it's so amazing how you captured what he went through um so I think doing art of that nature is really really important and it sheds light on what people are going through and it provides a voice to people that don't always have a voice. Exactly. Well, that's the thing. It's like probably anyone that is listening to this episode right now, they know somebody in their life that's going through some kind of mental health issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so important. And unfortunately, in this country, you know, we don't spend enough time, don't have enough resources for people who are suffering through a lot, a lot of the issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be very difficult, and we're still dealing with a lot of stigma around mental health, you know? There's a lot of people that don't feel comfortable talking about uh, what they're going through, particularly in professional situations or in relationships or um, in a public sphere because they are afraid of being judged, and often that fear is... is um, very much based in reality because there is a lot of judgment and it just comes from a lack of understanding. I don't, I think, I don't think there's anything malicious in that kind of judgment. It just comes from a lack of understanding and a lack of empathy. So the more that we can shed light on that, you know, it's not who a person is. It's just something that they are experiencing. It's just something about how their brain works and it's yeah. something that's treatable and it's something that you know doesn't define a person exactly and that's the exact reason why we're talking about it right now i mean it's so very very important so how else do you use your voice to make a difference i mean i'm very open about my mental illness for sure so i tend to talk very openly about my experiences about what I've been through I've blogged about it I've spoken about it and um, that to me is a powerful way because I know there are a lot of people who don't feel comfortable being open about their experiences and to me that's a shame because the more we can talk about it the more it starts to break down those walls and the more it breaks down those stigmas and people are able to realize wow, we're all just human beings, aren't we? We're all just in this together. And the more I can talk, the more it gives me power over my illness to know that it's not something that holds power over me, but something that I get to be 100% responsible for. Well, and the good thing to know is, you know, people are not alone. You know, whatever circumstances person's going through right now, someone else has been in that situation and people have overcome it. You know, they're not the only one. Now, yeah. Now, when when you were the, the diagnosed, you know, how how was that that whole experience? Because I'm sure, you know, in the beginning, you know, you don't know what's going on. And then when you find out, okay, well, this is this explains it. You know, how, how was that experience? It was definitely like I remember having this thought of like, well, this explains a lot, right? <laughs> of looking back at my life and, and part of the diagnosis is asking questions. So the doctors will ask a lot of questions. And uh, as I was answering these questions, I was like, I know exactly where this is going. I know what you're gonna say because I've known this myself for a long time and have been too afraid to admit it. So there's a real like, there's a coming to terms that has to happen and there's a, uh, a sense of grieving the life you could have had like a life of normalcy and there's a sense of um you know feeling feeling kind of broken as a person if i'm being totally honest i remember going through that and uh, there's a lot of forgiveness that has to happen with yourself as a person and 
definitely coming to terms with this is what the rest of my life is going to look like. And this is how I get to think of myself moving forward. And it has taken me a long time to get to a place where I feel very positive about my situation and uh, empowered and, um, and responsible and yeah, just positive about it. Like I definitely for a long time struggled with that a lot. And I think everybody does. And I think it's normal and you got to give yourself grace to go through that process, whatever that looks like for you. Um, for me, I really had to retreat. I stopped painting for two years and I started building the foundation of my life from scratch and rediscovering who I was as a person. So there was a lot of uh, rebuilding that had to happen for me coming from what was in many ways a sort of rock bottom and then building myself back up, finding my power, finding my voice, finding my confidence and uh, rediscovering the kind of person that I am, the kind of person I always have been, uh, but just getting back in touch with that again. And it, it's a really magical journey it's not an easy journey, but it is a really magical journey. And the result at the end of it is coming out so much stronger. And I have a real sense of resilience. I have a real sense of knowing that I can overcome anything that life throws at me. I have a real sense of being able to help others who are going through something similar. I have a real sense of continuing to tell my story because I know that it's the story of so many other people and it needs to be heard. Yes. If there's anyone out there, who's going through something like this, like you will get through to the other side. There's going to be ups and downs and sometimes you're going to feel like you're moving backwards. But if, if you just keep taking step after step after step, you are moving forward and you're going to get there. Yeah, well, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, you might have somebody who's listened to this episode and they have bipolar. It's like, oh my gosh, you are married. You have amazing husband, amazing son, and you're a badass leader. Oh my gosh. And you're comfortable in yourself and you're in such an incredible artist. It's like, you know, look at where you've come. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. You know, it's, I'm so extremely proud of you. It's like, you know, you are living proof for anybody who might be, you know, in their early teens or, you know, they're in their twenties. It's like, you know, you can overcome this. You really, really can. And there's nothing special about me that makes me able to do this where somebody else wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, I'm just a normal person like anybody else. And that means that we're all capable of, of having this great relationship with a mental illness, having a great relationship with your life, having a great relationship with yourself, and really having a great mindset and a positive outlook on life. You know, you don't have to feel defeated because you've got a mental illness. You don't have to feel like, uh, like you're less than or that you don't get to do all the things that you wanted to do in your life. You get to define exactly what your life is going to look like. It's beautiful. Have fun with it, you know, because it's anything is possible. It is definitely. So, what what's like three good things that you love for anyone who's listened to this episode to, to take away from this? <sighs> That's a very good question. Um, I would say, trust yourself, and. Trust that you are powerful enough to overcome anything. Trust that you already have everything within you that you need to get through this. And don't be afraid to ask for help. There are people out there who are ready to lift you up if you let them. You don't have to do it all alone. You don't have to go through this alone. Nobody needs to be alone. And, and I would say, I would say just believe. Just believe in yourself. 
and connect with who you really are. And that's not what you're experiencing on a day-to-day basis. It's who you truly are at the core and center of your being. And no mental illness is ever going to stop that from being who it's meant to be. So just connect with that light in your heart and let it shine. Very, very beautifully said. So Becca, for anybody who's listened to this episode, who's like, oh my gosh, you know, he keeps on talking about how wonderful her art is. How, how can they find you online? How can they purchase your art? How can they get connected with you? So I have an Instagram and it's at Becca Fox art. That's B E C C A F O X A R T. And the, I also have a website. It's the same thing. Becca Fox And those are really the two main places you can find me. Uh, If you go to my Instagram, you can send me an email. You can give me a call. I've got all my information on there. So that's probably going to be the easiest place to get in touch with me. And uh, if you want to reach out and talk about bipolar or depression, anxiety, or talk art, whatever you want, give me a call. Like I'd love to connect with anybody, anyone and everybody. That is so incredibly, incredibly awesome. Thank you so much. And of course, you know, I'm going to post a link and everything for this podcast because, you know, your art is so beautiful. It really, really, really is. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're so welcome. So thank you so very much for being on the Power of Your Voice podcast, Becca. I love you. You're amazing. <laughs> thank you, Johnny. So are you. You're so welcome. Bye. Bye. Johnny here. Thank you for listening to the Power of Your Voice podcast. I'd love to get your feedback on this episode and how it impacted you. If someone in your life could benefit from this episode, share it with them. Check out thepowerofyourvoice.com to read show notes, leave a comment on the blog page, and to stay updated on all future episodes, subscribe to this podcast and leave a five-star review. Thank you for your love and support.